Hi, I'm Jason Brown, General Manager of Applied Intuition Defense. Welcome to the latest edition of Nexus Talks, a forum for operators, luminaries, policymakers, and technologists working at the forefront of artificial intelligence and autonomy solutions for the warfighter. But before we begin, registration is open for Nexus 24, our annual national security symposium on the future of software-defined warfare. This year, we're hosting it at the REACH at the Kennedy Center on June 13th. You can register for free at the link in the description. We're making exciting changes to this year's program, and we'll be sharing those details very soon. Space is limited, so make sure you register today. You can expect to hear more conversations like the one we're having today at Nexus. We're here today with Dr. Rita Kanayev, Deputy Director of Analysis and a Research Fellow at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology to discuss lessons on defense technology from the Ukraine battlefield. Rita, it's great to have you with us today. So uh, just to kick things off, like what do we know about what's happening on the, in Ukraine? What do we know, uh, you know is happening with defense technology in that space? And what do we don't understand quite yet? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Jason. Um, I was thinking that it was 25 months now since the war started. And the first time that I had a big public facing conversation reflecting about this issue of technology and defense in Ukraine in particular was at the first Nexus event that Applied Intuition hosted with the Atlantic Council in DC. Um, almost two years since then, it's very difficult to say that the war is at a stalemate. The war has become a war of attrition. I don't think anybody of us wanted to say or hear those words because it's clearly an indication that it's been very difficult to get any significant breakthroughs and that a military uh, solution, essentially, a Ukrainian victory has not arrived at the pace that we were hoping for. So right now, about two years in and a little over two years in, we're at a point where Ukraine seems to be committed to defending the territory that it was able to gain during the previous counteroffensive. But that's coming at a really heavy price. First of all, in lives, as well as in lives of civilians, and of course, military personnel, but also in terms of equipment and ammunition and munitions of all different kinds. And it really is a moment for Ukraine where it's fundamentally important that it receives support, the support and the help that it needs in terms of military aid from its allies and partners. So when we're looking domestically, thinking two years ago about the incredible levels of commitment that the United States was expressing and the support that the, much of the world was voicing for Ukraine, I really hope that momentum keeps even as the war itself has seemed to be grinding on. Yeah, a war of attrition, uh, maneuver warfare is not really a thing right now. Um, what do you think that means as, as far as just in, gen in general around emerging technology and how it's being applied, um, you know, specifically AI and autonomy? Is there something we can be, you know, learning from that uh, uh, current situation? For sure. It's really interesting. I think we're in a situation where we talk and both of us have worked in this field of emerging and new technologies. You've, for much longer, I'm relatively new to doing research in this field. And we think about these technologies as these futuristic capabilities, but they are being used in the midst of a very conventional, old school war. And that contrast between this incredibly advanced, sophisticated technology that is being deployed when people are, you know, fighting and dying in, uh, in fields covered in mud and in trenches, that contrast is perhaps not something that a lot of people were envisioning when, when they think about the use of sophisticated tech like AI. But I think it raises a lot of interesting questions. And some of the topics that we're you know, hearing a lot about right now is trying to understand whether this use of autonomy and AI as it's been deployed over the last two years in Ukraine, seeing its most biggest test, biggest battlefield test thus far that, is, that it's seen is, are we witnessing sort of a gradual development and kind of a test and learn and adapt a little bit step by step, like incremental learning and developments? Or are we witnessing a true real revolution in 
commercial technology, in commercial technology for the battlefield, and just in perhaps even our concepts of operation and our entire bureaucracy around it. So right now, it seems to be tilting towards more the evolutionary element uh, rather than an all-out kind of ground uh, shifting um, the revolution in military affairs, affairs, the way that we talk about it often, but there's no doubt that the advances have been significant and perhaps to some degree even surprising for somebody like me who's a bit more of a skeptic when it comes to how quickly technology can move and the, the difference that the impact that it can have um, in these type of conventional um, old school wars. Yeah. Um, a lot of learning going on mm -hmm. is, is what I'm hearing. And so uh, on that note, do you th is there any learning or any perspective that of your own that's changed over the course of this conflict? Ha are you seeing things differently now than you did maybe uh, two years ago? Absolutely. And I was reflecting on that as well, because like I said, I tend to be quite, quite cautious when evaluating the effects of technology, especially new and emerging tech that hasn't really had a lot of battlefield experience about what it can do. And you have to really be careful about the sources that you read and how you evaluate information, because everything has an angle to an extent, yeah. right? But I will tell you a couple of things that have been surprising and seem to be impactful to me. Number one has been the speed and the flexibility within which commercial technology and commercial technology companies have been able to adapt themselves and their product offerings to military settings and military missions. We all know mm. that AI and autonomy are dual use, that or even you know, general purpose. We've heard that plenty of times before. We know a lot of the innovation, if not most of the innovation, is coming from the private sector. Yeah. But that transition from the commercial space into the, literally the battlefield, that adaptability, uh, First of all, you have to give the Ukrainians a hats off for that, but also to the commercial companies themselves and to the flexibility and ingenuity of the technology. So that to me is, is perhaps one of the areas that seem to be really kind of surprising and impressive at how quickly it moved. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah and that. this seems like a, a, an important lesson mm -hmm. for the DOD. I mean, uh, just watching what commercial technology companies have been able to do in, in this case, uh, in, in the war in Ukraine. What, what else do you think the DOD should learn from that experience? Would, you know, whether it be around this emerging technology, autonomous systems, what should they be taken away? So I think perhaps one of the main reasons or an important reason that the technology companies have been so successful in reaching the battlefield and learning and then adapting their product offerings is that they've actively, through the facilitation and help from the Ukrainians and the encouragement of Ukrainians, they've worked directly with the people on the ground, the war fighters, uh, the people who are documenting the war crimes that Russia is committing, the uh, intelligence analysis uh, analysts, the people who are actually on the ground. And that, I think, joint effort is really allowed to move those products from the, this is a cool idea, here's a gadget that can do something, to here is a tool that can save lives. Yeah. And the speed and flexibility and agility within which that kind of cycle has progressed is something that you would think would be kind of intrinsic to, to the Department of Defense because mm -hmm. that's who's at the root of the Department of Defense are the people on the ground. But I feel like we've gotten away from it. Yeah. What, so I couldn't agree more. Um, what do you think the core of that, you know, kind of deviation from the ability to adapt uh, as it relates to innovation on the, like in those circumstances. Where, where do you think that comes from? Uh, I think it's a combination of factor. I mean, we've all heard the kind of trite saying at this point that big ships are hard to turn sure. or yeah. <laughs> that was not the correct phrase, but y y you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, massive bureaucracies are incredibly difficult to shift. 
and you will have internal resistance because whether it's because people want to keep have a particular vision or people want to keep control of their pet rock or their resources yeah. or whatever it is that is vile to them and, and not out of you know a bad perspective but just because that's how they see that's their theory of victory um, the other area is that I think that this world that we are now in where both the massive amount of R&D investment and kind of the brightest minds quite often uh, and the most expensive talent, uh, all of that being so concentrated in the private sector, mm. I think that's something that is still difficult for the government and the Department of Defense in particular to adjust because of this massive legacy and history yeah. of being at the forefront of innovation, whether it was space or nuclear weapons or internet, GPS, all of these incredible inventions, if you trace them far enough, they're federally funded uh, adventures. Right. Yeah, but now we're in this very different world and I think the government is still adjusting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there's plenty of folks in the DOD who believe, you know, exactly, you know, what we're talking about, which is they're not moving fast enough. They're not, um, they're not getting beyond the bureaucratic hurdles to actually develop capability and field it. Um, one of the solutions to that, at least recently, is the replicator initiative, something that uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Hicks has talked about uh, many times. Um, and, you know, in the context of what we're discussing today, in the context of Ukraine, what should the DOD, you know, focus on as it relates to Replicator? How should they shape Replicator based on those lessons? Yeah, I mean, I think Replicator is an incredible idea. It's a massive pivot into the future. And I think it's also kind of a realistic understanding of the variety of challenges the United, and threats the United States might face because you have to be able, if you want to be a global power, if you want to uh, have a positive impact on stability around the world, you have to be as prepared to a challenge in the, in the Pacific as you are to instability in the Middle East. Sure. And for those purposes, I think Replicator, if done right and thought with a lot of you know, accountability and kind of ingenuity, once again, should be able to meet a variety of challenges. But I think an important lesson from what Ukraine has been doing with uncrewed systems and just being kind of at the helm of innovation in this space and doing it at scale has once again been this ability to understand that if you want a lot of things, you are going to have to work with a lot of different types of companies. So yeah. with a lot of companies and a lot of different types of companies, which are not the same thing. Mm. Uh, and for that, you once again have to have speed and you have to fl have flexibility and you have to have people who think outside of the box and people who are, you know, prepared and comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. and ready to get pushed and push themselves. And the Ukrainians, unfortunately, had no choice. And I really hope uh, that for the United States, the, the pressure is never like that. Right. that we are not forced to learn under fire, that rather the way that we are prepared prevents it. Yeah. You know, you, you're saying something incredibly interesting. I haven't really put it this way before, but the idea that we're only going to go to war with four or five big companies, that seems just unrealistic. And that, that's not a recipe for, for, for winning. Uh, I mean, you're going to have to open the aperture to a lot of different types of companies, a lot of different types of companies who have different talents, different backgrounds, different perspectives on how to bring capability to the warfighter. Once again, if we are, if we are forced to go to a war uh, with the same four or five companies, that is going to, by definition, restrict the type of equipment and capabilities and technologies we're able to bring to the front lines. Yeah, and, and perspectives yeah, and, perspective, and, and yeah, you know, of background, course, of course. et cetera. Yeah. yeah, and that's just, that's tying one hand behind our own back, which seems unnecessary, right, right. <laughs> not great. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, 
it, it'd be interesting also to understand, you know, we're not the only ones, I think, mm -hmm. who are going to take away a lot from the conflict in Ukraine. Certainly Russia is, obviously, um, and, you know, China will as well. What, are they going to have their own version of replicator, do you think? Do you think they're actually going to take some of these lessons and, and turn it into uh, uh, a program that looks or, or feels or, you know, very similar to replicator? Um, sure. So I think it's, you know, Russia is by no means kind of a global leader in drone technology, but Russia had a relatively successful program for certain types of drones. So the smaller kind of ISR focused drones, they like the Orlan types, they do relatively well with them and they've been able to scale up production on some of those systems. They have struggled much more significantly when it comes to those, the much larger, the heavier drones um, that can carry also munitions. So the, uh, the armed drones, uh, they have not been as effective in producing them. But they're definitely understanding and seeing the value uh, of using these technologies and the variety of missions for which they can be deployed. So yeah. but from ISR to supporting artillery strikes to then being used for information operations and propaganda from the videos that they record. So there's, there's massive, there's just like the whole gamut of how used and useful they can be. And Russia understood that it, whatever it can't, you know, do in house, it can get from uh, countries like Iran and North Korea when needed and many others and it can find ways to still get access to Western technology, which we constantly hear about, um, that they still are able to uh, get access to Western technology regardless of the sanctions and the export controls. So they have already been kind of investing in drones. Mm -hmm. And the same, but to a much larger and more successful scale is, is also true about um, you know China. We've done some work at uh, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, CSET, where I work on looking into Chinese military AI procurement, so what type of systems they're buying. And in the most kind of couple of years ago, we uh, put out a report that did somewhat a comparison. Obviously, you can't comp it's not apples to apples, sure. but you kind of want to see where the areas of emphasis are. And unmanned uh, systems, uh, across the domains, maritime's a big emphasis for them, but obviously, uh, you know, drones in the air is, are also a huge emphasis for them. So I think we have a comparable set of uh, areas that we are prioritizing for the United States and China uh, as well in, when it comes to uncrewed systems. And the thing is, though, that they have that massive kind of chunk of the commercial market. Yeah. Yeah. And they have been ahead, like with the G, uh, DJI drones, they've been quite ahead and quite, uh, quite kind of a powerhouse to deal with. And that's why you're seeing those drones on both sides of the war. And it's probably the most popular drones for the Ukrainians. Sure. Because once again, it's expendable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about kind of things things that we should be watching mm -hmm. the, with the, as it relates to both China and and Russia. And this is what CSET does incredibly well, by the way, is knowing what to watch around where the trend is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything specific around like drone and autonomy that we should be watching just, you know, off the cuff? Like what what sort of aspects of kind of the ecosystem, supply chain, whatever it might be, um, that might be an indicator for where China and Russia might be going with autonomous capabilities. So to me, I think two things might be really interesting. One is to watch their developments uh, in the maritime domain, which is, of course, yeah. is going to be it's the sphere of the competition. Uh, so to see what is the variety of systems that they're developing and what are their capabilities, because, you know, there is a reason that the breakthroughs in autonomy have been made in the air first, uh, as opposed to uh, on Is that because of D uh, DJI and? Uh, and uh, no, not, not in China in specific. I mean, just, you know, the breakthroughs in autonomous systems, uh, it, it starts with the air because there's oh, just sure. less of, a, less of uh, just pure physics problems uh, with fielding a system in the air as, a, as opposed to underwater. 
Uh, so there is just a lot of challenges when it comes to maintaining communications, ma radars, the, and just the massive scope right. of, of uh, the military, the, right. uh, of, excuse me, the maritime domain, just to see what sort of problems they are capable of solving there, I think would be interesting. And the second um, area that I think is important to watch and is also important for us to watch ourselves is if we're thinking about replicator more than just a bunch of different types of systems, but we're thinking about it as systems that can speak to each other, systems that can uh, work in concert. Sure. I'm looking for the word swarms, and, but, but it's, more, it's more than just the concept of swarms, right? Because uh, that can't be the only way that we're thinking about how to combine uh, and disperse different autonomous systems across all the domains. So I think it's also pertinent that we keep track on how China is thinking about that, mm. how are they thinking about networking different autonomous systems across the different domains, what sort of progress they're making in these communication structures, and more, even more fundamentally, how are they thinking about command and control in this area? How do they think about sending these systems into battle, about who's going to make decisions about where they go, what they execute, what is survivable, and what is acceptable? That's, so essentially cooperative mm -hmm. capabilities and multi, you know, from multiple domains acting, that is a very mm -hmm. powerful concept. That that's yeah, something absolutely. that uh, if, if the U.S. isn't thinking about, you know, China may be thinking about and watching that development is going to be very, very interesting. Absolutely. Dr. Rita Kanayev, thank you so much for the time today. This was an amazing conversation. I look forward to, you know, continuing it at Nexus in, in June, on June 13th. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us online. You'll see plenty of thought provoking conversations like this at Nexus 24. Registration is open. The link is in the description. We can't wait to see you there.